Hello everyone, Alistair Gold here. Time for a little bit of a tidy up chat just to kind of get all the little bits and pieces together ahead of Saturday's match at Newcastle. That very early lunchtime kickoff. How many of Spurs lunchtime kickoffs have been away this season? I think there's a load. Guesty was telling me earlier when we did the podcast that there's been a hell of a lot of away trips when we've had to get up very early in the morning. Um, so yeah, what to kind of crack on with? We've got various bits and pieces. We've got a bit of financial stuff. We've got a bit of homegrown player issues and stuff ahead of the transfer window, which has given me the biggest headache. Honestly, if you want to give yourself a huge headache, start to look into the whole homegrown stuff and how it affects Spurs and transfer window and everything. I went back and forth over so many very boring Premier League and European rules. Um, honestly, my head's still throbbing because of it. Um, and what else are we going to talk about? Uh, defenders and potential transfers. Uh, loan roundup, Jed Spence. Genoa, one of the bosses at Genoa has been talking about him. Uh, and I'm also going to dip into some of the Q&As as well. Uh, sorry, the questions. A Q&A with some questions that you left under the previous video as well. So, first off, financial stuff, um, before you all start yawning, but it does, in, you know, it essentially is what Spurs can spend. So, the very, very good um, financial reporter, Kieran Maguire, football financial reporter, has done a big old chart which looks at what, how much clubs can spend, as in how much are they above or below their squad cost cap uh, within the financial regulations. So... Just looking at it very quickly, the one who's absolutely stuffed right now appears to be Chelsea. Uh, they are £71.5 million pounds underneath, uh, sorry, over their cap. So they've seriously got to get some money through the door this summer before they can start doing anything. Leicester, if they were to come up, are going to be in a similar issue, 32.5. Newcastle, 27.7, which is why all the talk has been about them having to... Uh, shifts a, a big player at least this summer. Um... Forest and Everton are the two kind of next ones. We, we know of that because of their points uh, deduction. Aston Villa also in some issues. 19.7. That was the one I um, I think I mentioned a, a while back about Spurs looking at one or two of their players because they maybe sensed a potential kind of uh, thing that they could get in there and grab some players. Let's switch right to the other side now. Very top, the ones who have got a load of... Um, how do I call it? Uh, latitude, I guess, to, to be able to spend... Man City are top 154.2 million pounds. They are under their squad cost cap. Spurs are very close behind though, 153.5 million. And then you've got Brighton, 137.9 because of Brighton's absolutely, essentially just taking Chelsea for all the money they had pretty much, which is why, that's the irony, isn't it? Chelsea are 71.5 over, Brighton 137.9. Probably a lot of that has gone one way to the other as well. Um, what else we got? And then you've got Man U and Liverpool. Man U 136.8, Liverpool 108.6, and Arsenal on 57.3. So they're probably going to have to bring in a bit of money, but if they want to spend kind of any sort of money uh, this summer. So uh, yeah, that was it really. It's only kind of just a brief over. I don't know whether that is, um, I think that is just for this year or whether it is for the coming years. Um, obviously Spurs' massive revenue that they're bringing in now through the stadium, playing a big part in that, and also the fact that a lot of the stadium stuff doesn't get included as in the stadium debt. Um, so, yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's really interesting, that, and, and shows that really we know what Spurs are like, but technically they've got a lot of kind of uh, wiggle room there where the various um, measures and points deductions and all the other problems shouldn't affect them. However, there are a lot of teams that do. And maybe you look at that chart and you look at potential, um, you know, essentially act like pirates, I guess, isn't it? And go in there and see where you can ransack if they're kind of desperate, which, you know, Spurs did that with Everton and Forest over recent years. And it didn't actually help them because they managed, as in the other clubs, because it didn't help. They didn't get in there before the... Uh, before the although Everton, they did with Richarlison. And I think it was mainly the issue that Everton kind of wanted a bit more for him but again maybe that is Spurs taking that all into consideration um it's such a funny club isn't it it's is such a funny club so that's the financial stuff homegrown stuff oh honestly as soon as I said the word homegrown there just my temples started to throb um I haven't done it in a while Guesty's done a couple 
Um, and so I haven't done it for a long time. So looking up all the permutations, and I still think there's a bit of uncertainty, and that is over Pat Matasar. Honestly, that man, I'm not entirely 100% sure what's happening, but we'll talk about that. Right. So the reason that homegrown issues, foreign player limits, all of that is important is because with both the Premier League and uh, European competition, which we hope Spurs will be in back in next season, you are restricted in how many players of each you can have. Um, and then, obviously, with those restrictions, also will have a knock-on effect in the transfer window, because if you bring in a player that cannot fit into one of those squads, someone is going to have to come out. And if they're not sold or on loan, they're going to sit there unregistered. We've seen it with... Juan Foyth back in the day, I remember him, but getting taken out of the European squad by Pochettino, who called it one of the toughest things he's ever had to do. Um, and yeah, there's been others. There's, there's been other players in recent years as well. I mean, Danny Rose ended up not being registered in any squad for a year and just stayed there in the background at Spurs. So, yeah, when you bring all the lone players back to Spurs this summer, Spurs squad is huge. Huge. It's enormous, which is why they've got so much work to do this summer, as they always have. Doesn't this feel like this is a theme every single summer? Um, yeah, I mean, especially, as I've said before, a lot of players with a year left on their contracts. And I think maybe these squad limits will play their part in a lot of the decisions with them as well. Um, so, look, like I say, slightly different Premier League and Europe. They are, yeah, there's little, especially when it comes to the homegrown players, that's where there's differences as well. And also under 21 players is a bit of a pain in the backside in the European version compared to the Premier League. So the nitty gritty, apologies if any of this is boring, but I've kind of got to explain the rules to you. And it was boring for me. And I'm going to try and not make it as boring as possible. Um, so, first off, 25-man squad. That's what you're allowed for the Premier League. That's your total number of everything uh, in terms of senior players. Within that 25, clubs cannot register more than 17 non-homegrown players. Uh, and the remainder of the list, up to a total of 25, must be homegrown. So, essentially, you're looking at there 17 non-homegrown and 8 homegrown, if you can, if you can do it that way, because not all clubs can do it that way. Um, so just to clarify what a homegrown player is, the Premier League states a homegrown player is a player who, irrespective of nationality or age, has been registered with the club affiliated to the Football Association or the Football Association of Wales for a period, continuous or not, of three entire series, uh, seasons um, or 36 months before his 21st birthday or the end of the season during which he turns 21. And that's quite important, especially when it comes to Pat Matasar. So, the good thing about the Premier League list is that you're also able to name players 21 or under, regardless of where they've come from, on this under-21 list. So that's a massive help because it frees you up if you're buying some young, kind of talented players. Um, so for next year... Under-21 players will have to be born on or after January the 1st, 2003 to be on that list. So let's talk about players that we know are definitely not going to be on either of those lists next season. Eric Dyer and, Eric, uh, Eric Dyer and Ivan Perisic. We know that they are heading off to Bayern and Hajduk Split. So they're done. We, we don't need to talk about them anymore. Um, oh, <laughs> that sounds very harsh, but you know what I mean. In terms of these squad numbers, they're going to join them permanently. They're not part of these numbers. So I just mentioned the under-21s list. Now, this is a little bit of an issue because some of the players who are on the under-21s list this year are no longer going to be eligible to be on it next year. Radu Dragosin is one. Desnu Doggy is another. And Pat Matasar. All three of those can no longer be on the under-21s list for the 24-25 season. Alejo Valise can stay on it. He's not old enough yet. Um, Lucas Bergvall will be able to join him on that when he uh, arrives from Jurgarden on July the 1st. Pat Matasar. <laughs> Pat Matasar has been my biggest headache, and I still don't know if I've entirely got to the final answer of this. So you're going to have to bear with me on this because there is still a touch of uncertainty. Um, there really is, especially around whether he can be registered. And I mean, you know, complete uncertainty um, on this one. So. The uncertainty is whether he can become a homegrown player next season. Um, 
the uncertainty, um, and this is, you know, some people around Tottenham as well. I'm sure Tottenham know what they're doing, but some people around Tottenham, uh, and, it, and it kind of is on the point of technically when a player heads out on loan, their registration at their parent club is suspended and transferred to the loan club. So under that rule, Pat Matassar, who has, is 21, but he turned 21 this season, has only been registered for Tottenham for two seasons. You might remember the rule I just read out. They have to have been there for three. However, the big old kind of spanner that's been thrown in the works of that kind of thinking is Arsenal. Because Arsenal did this thing where they continued to register William Saliba on their under-21s list for the Premier League throughout his three loan seasons he had at St Etienne, Nice and Marseille. Um, oh, three loans, sorry, at those three clubs. And they're now being heralded as founding this amazing loophole because this season um, he was able to be registered as a homegrown player for Arsenal. So I looked back at the registered squads for the 21-22 seasons and yep, you know, Saliba is on there, registered as an Arsenal player despite the fact he was out on loan. I also noticed that Pat Matassar, despite the fact that he was on loan that season back at Mets, is also registered on Tottenham's uh, under-21 list, as Saliba was with Arsenal. So by logic, that would suggest to me that if you're just taking that into account, if Arsenal can now register Saliba as a homegrown player, then so surely can Tottenham with Saar next season, which would help them in certain aspects. The only other way I could think of um, and looking at maybe a reason why he couldn't be is that Saar was signed on August the 27th, 2021, which is two weeks into the Premier League season. So whether they, it has to be an entire season, that term is used, although he was registered in the season's final list for that season. See what I mean? This is why my brain has been hurting. Um, yeah, it's uh, it, it's very difficult to work out. Um because, yeah, there's that. And I don't understand this kind of uncertainty over whether he can, because surely Saliba's homegrown registration has essentially found the, the route through. Um, so, yeah, it is whether it's to do with that, it's whether it's to do with something else in the background that maybe it wasn't. Really, I don't know. I don't know. But right now, there still remains this uncertainty over it. Um, so what I've had a look at, if you look at the current Premier League squads for next season, if they weren't to sign anybody, and, and they will, don't worry, don't worry, I hope, but they will. Um, and if they keep all of the players that they currently have, which again, they won't, um, and they sign Timo Werner permanently, and they take up the extra year in Ryan Sessegnon's contract so he doesn't leave this summer, um, this is kind of roughly where we'd be at. Non-homegrown players, there's a lot of them. Get ready for this. Vicario, Emerson, Porro, Dragashin, Udogi, Romero, Van der Ven, Regulon, Bentenker, Bissouma, Hoybier, Lo Celso, Mana Solomon, Brian Hill, Dayan Kulusevski, Richarlison, Son, Werner, Ondembele. And that's if we're not including Sar in that. So how many is that? Have I just said 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. So technically only two over if Sar's not um, included in that list. I'm just proving to you I can count there. Homegrown players, there's a load there as well. Fraser Forster, um, Brandon Austin, Whiteman, Davies, Session on Skip, Madison, Johnson, Roden, Spence, Parrott, Tanganga, Sar if we're including Saar. Um, and also, you've got under-21 players like Dorrington, Donnelly, Scarlett, Valise, Devine, Phillips, and like I said, Bergwald as well. So that's a lot of players to get. I mean, you've got 19, I said, uh, non, um, sorry, non-homegrown. But then just in those homegrown players there, you've got three, four, five, ugh, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So you've got 27 there to get into a 25-man squad. And that's not even taking into account signing new players. So we know some of those loan players will probably not eventually come back to Spurs or they will come back and then go swiftly on to something else. Um, but yeah, you can see space needs to be made. That's the main point of that. Then we've got European football. Um, European football, um, which is... Ugh, things get slightly more complicated. I'm sorry if I've lost you so far. You you know now you you know exactly where my head's been at while I've been kind of looking into all of this. So 
in UEFA uh, have uh, in European football two lists. An A and a B list is what you have to submit. Um, on the A list, the rules state no club can have, again, no more than 25 players on their A list and two must be goalkeepers. The rules then say, as a minimum, eight of those 25 players are re reserved exclusively for locally trained players. Did I say eight earlier or seven Low, um, homegrown players? If I said seven, I meant eight. I can count. Honest, honest I can. Um, I'm sure people have said a comment if I did say it. Um, yeah, on UEFA's rule, eight of those 25 places are reserved exclusively for locally trained players and no club may have any more have more than four association trained players listed among those eight places. If a club has fewer than eight locally trained players in their squad, then the maximum number of players on list A is reduced accordingly. So, what is a locally trained player? You might ask that. You might have already gone, oh my goodness, I'm not listening to this rubbish. There's two types of locally trained player. One is a club trained player. Those are the ones who have been on a club's book for three entire seasons or 36 months between the ages of 15 and 21. Again, that three entire seasons, whether that plays a part, we'll see. The other is association trained players. And those who are on the club uh, books of another club within the same FA for three entire seasons or 36 months between the ages of 15 and 21. Then you've got the B list, which is the young players. That is the ones who are born after, on or after 1st of January 20, uh, 2003 um, and have been eligible to play for the club for a period of two years since their 15th birthday by the time they're registered with UEFA. Um, or for a total of three consecutive years with a maximum of one loan period to a club from the same association for a period not longer than one year. Players aged 16 may be submitted if they've been registered with the club for the previous two years without interruption. Right away from that boring -y bit. Um, it may all be boring to you. It was even worse for Spurs a couple of years back because it's only two years ago that UEFA introduced a rule where Welsh players who had played in clubs uh, under the English FA were then suddenly allowed to be homegrown. Before that, the likes of Ben Davies um, and now Joe Roden, or Joe Roden in recent years as well, have been considered to be uh, non-locally trained despite the fact it's ridiculous that they were, you know, Welsh players, but playing within the English system anyway. So that has now changed, and they are. They're, they can be seen as homegrown players, um, club trained, of course. No, sorry, association trained players. Um, so that's helped them. Another issue, straight off the bat, that we're going to have is, I spoke earlier about the young players. The difference between the Premier League list of young players and the European list, the UEFA list, is that you... Like I said, you can't have a player on that list if they've only been at the club for a certain amount of years, uh, or less than a certain amount of years. So that means Velis and Lucas Bergvall will not be able to be on that list, uh, the B list. So if Spurs want to include them in their European squad list, they would have to be in the main list as non-locally trained players. So that creates an issue straight away, because it adds to that big list of players that I've already told you. So... Um, looking at the list, there's 21 on that list, if we're not including Saar. If he meets both Premier League and UEFA regulations, because there's some suggestion that maybe there's a slight difference in that. Again, I can't find it, despite my many attempts to look at it. Um, and it's, again, whether they take entire seasons a lot. That could be where the sticking point is. But if it's 21 without Saar, 22 with him, just shows you how many and that's just non-locally trained that's not everyone else as well so that is a huge squad that in europe is going to cause a massive issue unless they get i mean you're looking at six seven eight players have got to go out the door at least i think um because like i say the eight locally trained players, four of those have to be club trained. It's not like you could just shove eight in from the association trained ones. Four have to be club trained. And that in itself is another issue <laughs> because Spurs have allowed their club trained player numbers to dwindle. Um, Harry Kane and Harry Winks both have left in the last year. They both were club trained players that satisfied that need. That leaves only really six players if we're including Saar, and we're still uncertain of whether he actually is included in that list or not. Then, dive into that a little bit deeper, and I'll tell you that list right now. That list of club-trained players right now would include Brandon Austin, Alfie Whiteman, Oliver Skip, Troy Parrott, and Jaffet Tanganga, and Saar if we're going to include him. Tanganga 
is up is likely to leave next uh, this coming summer because he's not going to play. Um, he wants to play regularly. He has not been part of the plans this season. Troy Parrott potentially could be the same. Um, Spurs have got an option. I think he's got a year left in his contract, and Spurs have got a year, to, another year option to extend on that. So I'd be surprised if Troy comes straight back into the team and is challenging. Uh, unless he has an incredible preseason, we'll see. He's got a bit of an injury at the moment, so he's not playing for Excelsior Rotterdam either. So that's potentially two players who you're not going to keep around the club to register for European squad. Then I would also say between Brandon Oss and Alfie Whiteman, probably one of those two players going as well. So that means you're right down there already. Um, so that means you've got three gone of that six. And that six is only six if Pat Matasar is part of that list. And they've got to have four. The next problem is Oliver Skip. Oliver Skip will want to get regular football next season. He will want to, if he's not going to get it at Spurs, he will want to go next season to play on loan somewhere or whatever. He needs regular football. But essentially, I wonder now, where Spurs have got themselves in this scenario where they have to tell Oliver Skip, sorry, you've got to stay. You've got to stay. Um, and we'll try to get you minutes, but we, you know, you can't promise it. But they have to have club training. The only way around it I could see is if they actually used up four or three or four or whatever of their club trained places by putting under 21s in there when they don't need to be in there, which would be a complete and utter mess um, of, of squad management, I guess. So, yeah, it's one of those things that I think is kind of brewing, uh, bubbling underneath. Um, and maybe, you know, it's something that's it's just going to have to be fixed in the in the summer. Um, it's a difficult one, though, because can you? Can you fix that club? Because you can't bring in a player and make them club trained. It doesn't work like that. It has to be. And again, it is something they've neglected in a way by allowing, I guess, Harry Kane to go is the biggie um, because he was such a key part of that. And, and whether you have to keep Brandon Austin and Alfie Whiteman, both of them, just to have another... So you have these four senior goalkeepers, two of them 25 years old and needing regular football. It's a, it's a bit of a mess. It is. I mean, just I was looking at the numbers here. So you've got 21 non-locally trained, eight association trained, so you're up to 29 already, six club trained there, so 35 players, and that's not including the young players like Alfie Dorrington, Jamie Donnelly, Dane Scarlett, Alfie Devine. So that is mad. 35-man squad that's got to go into 25 while also including four club-trained players. So again, apologies if all of that was very boringly explained, but it kind of shows you that there's an issue there. And again, with Pat Matasal, we've got to find out exactly how that's going to work for him and, and whether he can be homegrown. I'm struggling to find the reason why he can't unless it is the date he signed. That's the only thing I can think of. Um, I can't see how the loan uh, season at Mets um, trips him up because Saliba has done that and Saar was, um, was on the list of registered players that season for Spurs. So it can only be the date for me, which is, yeah, we'll see. We'll see, I've also put in a, a query to the Premier League. I haven't got back to me yet. Try to find out from them. So I will get an answer. Um, so, yeah, you know, it's... And again... They want to bring in transfers. That's what they want this summer. They want new faces. Ange has said, I want a player. I didn't call him Nuno there. Ange has wanted, wants a player, I think, pretty much in every position of the squad. He said that right across the squad. I need improvements. Um, you know, I certainly know because I've been doing some digging around about uh, defensive stuff um, in the last couple of days. I know, from what I understand, Spurs are expected to firm up their interest in Tosin Adarabayu, the Fulham uh, defender, ahead of a potential move. Uh, on a, as a free transfer at the end of the season. Um, he's been one of the star men for uh, uh, Fulham this uh, season after coming back from groin surgery. He's played pretty much every minute for them since coming back. And uh, we saw firsthand um, at Craven Cottage against Spurs that he helped Fulham keep a clean sheet as they won that 3-0. Um, Fulham so far have been unable to keep him. Um, there's a growing interest in him as well. Like I say... Uh, it's not just Spurs. That's the other issue they face. I think there's a couple in the top six also looking in. A um, few from abroad as well. If you're not aware kind of what his skill set is, Adarabayu, you know, he's an accomplished player. He's good in the air. He's also got a turn of pace. I looked up. On the first weekend of the season, he was clocked as the quickest defender on the opening weekend with a speed of 34.80 kilometres an hour. So, you know, no slouch. Um 
he uh, I think Van der Ven's been clocked at 37, so he is incredibly fast. But uh, yeah, it's uh, yeah, he, he he's no slouch at all. And from my understanding, he'd be open to to coming to Spurs. There was a suggestion last summer that he rejected Spurs for a move to France and all that. I don't, from what I understand, I don't think that was the case. I don't think it actually got that far with Spurs because Fulham just had no intention of selling. Um, you know, and yeah, I mean, he's going to, any player that's going to come in in that kind of fourth extra centre-back slot is going to have a battle on their hands. You've got Romero, you've got Van der Ven, you've got Dragashin as well. Um, and yeah, from what I understand, he's not, you know, worried about that challenge if that were to be the, the move he makes. Uh, Spurs showed real significant interest in him last summer. It um, Postacoglu was keen from what was told. He was one of the ones that he liked, um, and the data backed that up. But yeah, Fulham just would not let him go. And now, you know, I guess you could argue they've got a good season out of him, very good season, and uh, you know they're nowhere kind of near being in any kind of danger this season. So yeah, they're going to come out of it with uh, another year in the Premier League. I guess maybe that's what you weigh up. Perhaps I don't know when you're looking at it all. But yeah, they would not let him go. Um, but yeah, this time around, if they can't convince him to stay Fulham, then apparently they've been offering quite decent contracts to try and make that happen. Then it's just Spurs, I suppose, seeing if they can beat the competition to get him. Um, but certainly there remains interest there. Last summer, when they couldn't, they realised that Fulham were just not going to let him go. They um, went to Bournemouth and put in a bid that was rejected for Lloyd Kelly. It's another player that Postacoglu likes, fits his system. Um, and what is good about Lloyd Kelly is that he can play uh, left back as well. And he's done that for Bournemouth quite a bit this season as well, uh, in terms of either playing through the centre or as a left back. And he's a bit of a, a captain, a kind of leader. He, he's won the armband for a few times this season and a fair bit of the first half of last season. The only, and it sounds like as well, that he was, he did have his head turned by the sounds of it. He wasn't um, picked for the uh, first game after the Spurs bid was rejected because the manager, Areola, wanted um, players that were focused on the match. So it does kind of suggest that he he did kind of, was looking at Spurs. I've only, only taken it, you know, from what they've, uh, from, from what the manager said. Um, his main issue, Kelly, I think, has been injuries. He's missed 12 games this season with a hamstring and a hip problem. Um, last season, he missed a fair bit with an ankle issue as well. Um, but yeah, he started most of the 17 Premier League matches he's been available for this season. Um, so yeah, it'd be interesting to see. For me, those two make the most sense because they're homegrown again, um, which obviously is helpful, although there's only so many homegrown players you can have as well if they're not club trained. Um, and they're free. And I know I can immediately hear people are going, oh, why are you going to sign free transfers? But think about it for a moment, and I might have said this before, if you're looking at a, f a fourth centre-back to come in there, would you really want to spend huge money when you've kind of got three very good centre-backs there? And if you can get another very good one who is also homegrown to back it up for free... I think you're kind of daft not to try and go for that. It makes complete sense to me. Um, you know, they, they like other players. They like um, Ilya Zabani, I've said before, uh, who's also very fast. Um, got a turn of pace on him as well. But he's going to cost you money. I think he's got a couple of years left on his deal. Um, who else you got? Crystal Palace. Um, Mark uh, Gay, uh, 23 years old, England international. Brilliant player. Spurs have liked him for ages. But... Two years left in his contract. Most of the Premier League's top clubs are looking at him. From what I understand, 50 to 60 million is going to be the kind of price tag you're looking at him for him. Do you spend that? The only way I can see that is if one of those centre-backs already at Spurs goes, like, I don't know, let's say, I don't know, Barcelona or Real Madrid come in for um, Romero, let's say, and then you have to replace him. Maybe that's when you go for Mark Gay. But... I don't see the logic of spending that sort of money on that position for another centre-back when I think other areas of the team are probably more of a priority. Could be wrong, but, you know, it uh, doesn't seem to make much sense to me. Um, the other side to it, of course, you've got to look at as well. A new centre-back comes in and you're blocking the path of Ashley Phillips and Alfie Dorrington. So, yeah. Or do you keep them there as the, the kind of fifth centre-back? Uh, because... 
European competition, if Spurs are in it, we all hope they are. And if they go further in domestic cups, you are going to have a lot of games compared to this very kind of game bear season. So, yeah, one of those is going to have to go out on loan, you'd imagine, at least. Uh, if not both, we'll see. Talking of loans, a uh, very quick loan roundup for you. Just starting with Jed Spence, because Genoa, um, their sporting director, Marco Atolini, uh, has been speaking. He spoke to the court offside about Jed Spence. He said, I speak with Jed every week. We have created a good environment for him. We're trying to make him feel warm and welcome here. And this will then translate into his performances on the pitch. We want to give him the right conditions to perform. We still have seven games to go and we want to see what he can do. Personally, I like Jed and how he is doing and how he is training. Of course, he can do more and he knows this, but we're in contact with Spurs and we'll evaluate a deal over the next few months, giving us time to understand both our, position, our positions and Jed's perspective on potentially staying here. So if I remember rightly, there was um, an option put in there. I think it was about 10 million euros, which is what, about 8 million, 7.5, something like that. So which is a fraction of what Spurs, uh, or not as much as Spurs paid for him anyway. So the kind of things I took from that is that, you know, he's he's made an impact there. He has. He has he's not been a regular starter there, but he has made an impact. The other bit that I did see, of course, he can do more and he knows that. It's a little bit disappointing, but unfortunately just seems to be a bit of a theme. Um, but hey, you know, it does feel like this one. I mean, he's got more minutes at Genoa than he has at Leeds, um, and he has at Spurs it, it, completely. So it kind of, it's been a success to a degree without being a roaring success. Um, and actually, uh, Ottolini also said, I remember I was at Craven Cottage in 2017 when Fulham's then academy director, Hugh Jennings, uh, there was an under-23s game and I noticed Jed for the first time. He went on to Middlesbrough and alone at Forest before being sold to Tottenham. So I knew all about his characteristics from back then and they were fresh in my mind when we spoke to Tottenham. Jed had not had good loans, that was at Wren and Leeds, but I still knew his quality and we were looking to strengthen it right back in January. Through our discussions with Tottenham over Radu, the possibility of taking Jed on loan emerged. We knew he had struggled a bit for Leeds. I don't want to say the move was a risk for us, but let's just say it was clear his profile was not at its best and maybe he was suffering from a mentality problem. We thought maybe Genoa could provide a different environment to get the best out of him, so we decided to complete the loan. So, yeah, it's an interesting one. It is. I, I, I want, I'd love to see what's going to happen with Jed Spence's career and what he'll do with it. Um, feels like there's been some progress made at Genoa, um, but still, obviously, they're saying, and he can do more, and that's probably why he's not in the starting right lineup regularly there's been a couple of times he's been in it and done well uh, against Juventus apparently he was excellent um re did really really well for them in that game there's been other games where he started he's been taken off at half time and there's been other games where he's come on at half time or he's been brought on late in games uh, either on the left or the right to, to help the team out but look it's all experience I guess it's all part of it he's only 23 years old um there's more to come just hopefully he kind of realises exactly what the requirements are, I guess. to There's only so many clubs you can go to before it maybe clicks and you realise, oh, I see, yeah, yeah, it, maybe I've just got to do more. Uh, and hopefully that's, that's what will come to him because he's got a lot of talent. Uh, and this is why when kind of people ask me, like, oh, is Postacoglu going to give him a chance? He's going to be there next season. I think the, the probably the likelihood is no. He, you know... Uh, in the summer last year, he wasn't really in consideration. And then when he came back from Leeds, he was training with the under-21s. He was not part of the first team consideration. So I think Postacoglu's probably seen what he needed to see or didn't, or what he didn't want to see, I don't, maybe, something like that. So, yeah, I mean, he, he came on for the final 12 minutes. Genoa played last week in early 1-2-1 against Hellas Verona. Um, he only had seven touches of the ball, but... Uh, did make three clearances, and he had a 100% pass success rate from one pass. But still, all counts. Like I said, he's played nine matches in Serie A, 455 minutes to his name, which is more than his seven appearances at Leeds, and far more than Spurs. I think he's played something like 40 something minutes for Spurs in all, which is just, yeah, ridiculous. Um, and just kind of shows what a daft transfer it was, I guess, in all. Um, moving on to the lone roundup, Tongi. Tongi Ndombele, he was involved in probably the most mad match of the weekend, if you can even consider it a match, um, the Turkish Super Cup final on Sunday. So if you're not aware what happens with that, uh, the Turkish Super Cup final was meant to take place in December. Um, I think it was meant to be in Saudi Arabia. 
it was certainly another country. Um, it didn't happen for reasons kind of quite well. I'll let you read up on it. Um, it, it just it didn't end up happening. So it got rescheduled for this last Sunday. Uh, it's Galatasaray against Fenerbahce. Fenerbahce were not happy. They'd wanted the game to be rescheduled again because they got a uh, Europa, Europa League quarterfinal tonight against Olympiacos. So I know in England, we the Premier League absolutely just batter teams that are going to be playing in Europe. They don't really care whether they're playing in Europe or don't seem to. Uh, in other countries, they kind of they ease their league fixture schedules for those teams in Europe to give them a bit longer rest um, or preparation time for Europe. I guess it reflects on their leagues. So that didn't happen with this game and Fenerbahce were very unhappy. And so what they decided to do, and kind of in protest, they um, fielded a um, under-19s team. Um, and if that wasn't quite uh, enough of a protest, after a, a minute, within 50 seconds, uh, Galatasaray had scored, Icardi scored. Fenerbahce then took those young under-19 players off the pitch and said, yeah, we're done. Thank you very much. We're taking our ball and we're going home with it. That meant that the game was awarded to Galatasaray. They won the Turkish Super Cup. Um, I, think, I don't know if it goes down as a 1 0 result, I presume it would. Then I think they realised oh, all these fans in the stadium who have bought tickets and now have no more football to watch other than a minute of action. So what Galatasaray decided to do was put out a team of first team players against a team of reserve players. Um, Tongi was not in the original starting lineup. He was on the bench. Um, he was unused in that minute, as, as you would expect. Um, but he certainly played his part in this kind of inter house friendly that ended up happening because I've seen pictures of him wearing his beanie hat. And Tongi will, I have witnessed in the hottest of temperatures on pre season tours, Tongi wearing that hat in training. And in training matches, and me wondering how on earth he is not spontaneously combusted. Um, but yeah, so that was his part in a very, very strange day uh, where Galatasaray won a trophy without really having to do anything at all, um, which is very odd. But there you go. Who else on the loan list? Sergio Regulon, uh, Agent Reggie. Uh, he helped Spurs last weekend, if you didn't see. 3-3 um, Brentford Villa. He got two of the assists and was involved in the other goal. So that was terrific uh, for Spurs. Um, you would imagine he will also move on this summer. I'd imagine all of those three Spurs will be looking to sell this summer. Regulon, I don't think they'll have any issues with. I wonder whether Brentford will come in with a bid if they stay up. Because, you know, he's been a certain starter for them, really, when he's been uh, fit and available. And he was sent off against Burnley, I think it was. So he missed the game after that. Um, but, yeah, he should be fine to be able to get kind of to another club. Spence, it might be a low... It depends how much this kind of move has restored his reputation because there was very little interest in him other than Genoa. And that was because Spurs were already talking to them. Tongi, I don't know what they're going to do with Tongi. How to solve a problem like Tongi on Um, You know my feelings on Tongi. The most incredibly... One of the most talented players I've seen pull on a Spurs shirt. But unfortunately, just the rest of him doesn't match up to that he doesn't realize that potential because i don't know i don't know why so many managers have not been able to get him to work uh in the way they want him to if you're going to go to the turkish league with a player of his quality and barely start a match there's something more to it like i say how many different managers and clubs can be wrong i i, I I don't get it. I don't get it. It's such a shame. That will be one of the biggest wasted talents in football for me if he doesn't kind of realise what he's going to do. Look, he may look and say, hey, I went to Italy last season, went to Napoli, I won the Scudetto. And it's like, well, you did, yes, on paper. Your CV will always show that. But you, most of the games you got came on maybe very late in the match, in like the last two, three, ten minutes or so, um, when you are good enough to be starting for most teams. You know, if he could realise his potential, he would be starting for, I'd say, any team in the world if everything else matched his ability, because he's incredible ability. But it's just not there, is it? Um, Alejo Veliz, he had a weekend off. Um, I think Sevilla were due to play one of the Copa del Rey teams, Athletic Club or Mallorca, but that didn't happen, um, obviously, because they were playing in that. Um 
so we'll see. It's not working out for Valise at the moment. Um, and I do wonder whether, because of those squad numbers, uh, like I say, whether he ends up going back on loan again next season, because there might not be room for him. Um, Joe Roden continues to do very well. Kept a clean sheet on Tuesday night against um, Sunderland. Yeah, he's having a good season. Terrific season. He won't be any issue for Spurs to to get a move. And I'm sure he'll hope that it's Leeds. And because uh, good old Welsh contingent there. Troy Parrott still not back from his quad injury. He uh, missed out on Excelsior Rotterdam's past five matches he had. Yeah, uh, I don't know what's going to happen with him in the summer, whether it'll be a loan or a permanent move, but there's certainly interest in him um, from various clubs in various countries. Serie A, I think the Bundesliga as well, championship clubs all monitoring to see what happens. So keep an eye on that. Jaffet Tanganga, um, I'm really happy for Jaffet. Um, he played Tuesday night, 90 minutes as as Millwall won one nil at home against Leicester. Big clean sheet that against the you know title hopeful. Uh, I think all the top three in the championship um, weren't able to win, which is uh, yeah a bit of a kind of funny week for them. But yeah, for Jaffet, I'm so happy because you know there's been concerns about his knee. He wasn't able to play for Augsburg for a long time. It's just been injury fragmented seasons for him. But he is now at a stage where he is playing Saturday, Tuesday for, for Millwall. And he's brilliant. He's playing 90 minutes. And he's doing really well for them. So happy for him. Um, yeah, just... Um, yeah, the summer, I think, it just again has to go for his own regular football. But hey, maybe the club train thing. Maybe Spurs have to look at that and think, Ugh, do we have to kind of keep him around? But it's so unfair. It's so unfair for a player. Um, because the club hasn't managed their kind of, you know, squad numbers right. Um, Alfie, uh, Alfie Devine and Ashley Phillips, obviously both at Plymouth at the moment. Alfie's struggling a little bit to get in the team. He did get his first sending off in Ian Foster's last game uh, before he uh, left the club. Uh, so that meant he missed the next game, but then came back and was an unused sub on Tuesday night. QPR 1-1 draw. Ashley Phillips played 74 minutes, so he's got a fair... For Ashley Phillips, this move has been terrific. He, he's starting every game pretty much um, and doing very well. It's been a good developmental loan for him back in the championship. For Alfie, there's some debate to be had there whether it would have been better for him to stay at um, uh, in in League One or not, or, or whether the move to the championship has been a good one for him. Uh, yeah, personally, I don't know. I don't know whether just kind of staying there out would have been better for Alfie. He was getting regular football. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm trying to think about it, really. Just, just trying to look at some of the numbers, like the game time he had. Let's just have a little look. I didn't write that down. Whether I think he was starting almost every single game. Um, where we got? Sorry. I didn't put that in my notes. Let me just have a look back. Port Vale, Port Vale. He was, yeah. Yeah, he was. He started 80% of the matches, I'd say. Um, so, yeah. It's it's, diff it's whether you judge it on getting experience of playing against higher level of teams or whether playing 90 minutes or regular football is the key. It's probably somewhere in the middle, isn't it? But yeah, not not great for him, but we'll see um, what happens. Uh, kind of essentially, there was a hope, I think, this summer that, you know, he was going to have a kind of a place in the team and try, he did really well under Postecoglou last summer. But with Lucas Bergville coming in and it's not quite working for him at Plymouth, we'll see. We'll see. There's still you know, a little way to go left of the season. Um, Matthew Craig's having a terrific end of the um, second half of the season. He's gone to Doncaster Rovers. Doing brilliantly. So good for them. Um, they've won seven in a row under Grant McCann. Um, and he's played 14 times in League Two. Mainstay of that uh, midfield. Defensive midfielder, but he's still scored. He's got an assist. Doing really, really well. Keep an eye on Matthew Craig. It's been a yeah, a terrific um, spell for him. And he'll have come on leaps and bounds. I'm intrigued to see whether, you know, Postacoglu comes back for pre-season training. And he'll be involved with the under twenty ones. Um oh sorry, development squad under twenty threes. No, under twenty ones now. And whether Postacoglu looks at him and it's just like, Oh hello, what's happened to Matthew? What's happened to Manny Craig? He's he's come on leaps and bounds. Um we'll see. We'll see. Um 
Two goalkeepers having a good loans. Josh Keeley's uh, going to have playoff football in the National League. That's going to be great for him. Uh, you might have heard me say goalkeepers, just getting any loan for them is important. It's, it's so rare. You know, how many clubs have got one spot? You know, you are. It's different to any other position on the pitch. And Josh is doing really well. Only 20 years old, Republic of Ireland, under 21 international. Um, he's getting plenty of game time there. And uh, Sam Archer has gone on a work experience loan to Barton Rovers. He's, I think they're playing tonight, but before tonight, he had four clean sheets in a row. Um, it's only a work experience loan. He's only 17 years old. And it is, yeah, it's a lower level of football, Southern League, Central Division 1. Um, it, it was a nil-nil draw against Waltham Abbey, who, funny enough, I used to cover back in the day, or one of my many non-league teams I used to cover. Um, but, yeah. 17 year old getting that kind of exposure to first team football that level of football has got all kinds of players it's got players in there like 30s that have played for bigger clubs it's got players young players that have dropped out of premier league academies or football league academies it's a real mix of players and uh, a great experience for him so yeah really happy for him um yeah looking ahead to newcastle I just hope it's nothing like the game from earlier this se uh, last season, late last season, earlier this year. Uh, you can see my brain's melted from the homegrown stuff. Um, but at least the weather looks to be better. That's one good thing. Uh, apparently it's going to be quite a sunny day, uh, which I'm very happy about because yesterday and I got absolutely soaked um, last season. Uh, they're, they're, I think I said in the last one, their press box is not covered. Um, in terms of the team, I'd probably say maybe just maybe midfield changes. There's two ways to look at it: is that you could bring in uh, Hoiber and Bensonker, which would make sense after their really good second half performances. But then the other aspect is you're going to be pressed quite high up the pitch. It's going to be real kind of uh, enthusiastic Newcastle players who are in better form now. They've got had less games. They've got people back from injuries. Um, they're going to be a noisy crowd like it was at St. James's Park earlier this year. So does Basuma actually help you in those situations because of his confidence on the ball and the ability to kind of take the ball from the defenders and spread it out quickly to the wing? We saw Hoybier tr try one of those, which didn't work out too well in that second half, but he did do it a few times quite well. Personally, I would probably go with Hoybier and Bentengo just for that extra experience, the leadership that they kind of both can bring in the midfield in a tough game with Madison. Otherwise, the rest of the team I'd probably keep the same. Um, it's a difficult one because if I'm Hoybier and I've come in and I've done really well, really helped change the game second half, and I'm not put in, that's tough to take. I know his future might not lie at Spurs. He's only got a year left. He's what started six Premier League games this season, which isn't enough. I think that would be incredibly harsh on him. Let me know in the comments what team you would pick, but I would probably go with those, uh, with that, with the the two check, half time. Check, essentially, the team that started the second half is what I would go for. I don't think you need to change up front. I don't think Decky came on and did particularly well. Um, whereas I think Brennan Johnson, and Timo Werner have got a nice kind of partnership going at the moment. Charlison, maybe we'll find out tomorrow at the press conference if he's fit enough to play a part. Probably not going to stick him in, are you, in the starting 11? Because he's barely played much football in the last month or so. Um, but yeah, that's what I'd go for. It's going to be a tough game. It really is. It's, it's not going to be um, an easy ride at all. Um, Spurs are going to have to be on it absolutely from the first minute. We saw that last game. Ugh. It was just like... It just got carved open so many times. Um, and But look, played very well against them at home. I know Newcastle were a bit knackered. It was a run where they had not too many players. Although Spurs had their injuries as well. But I think Spurs had that little bit more recovery time. Um, but if they play like they did that day, they'll cause them a lot of problems. Um, yeah, we shall see what Saturday brings us. So right, just a couple of uh, question Q&A thing to kind of wrap it up for you. Um <laughs> that's a quite a, a, an involved question straight off the bat Rob Lamb 9330 asks an average day in the life of Spurs supporter would give us an interesting insight into your work and life Alistair travelling interactions with supporters food on the go uh, mixing with other reporters and what does your work entail <sighs> yeah that probably is a video in itself isn't it travelling um, mostly it's train 
uh, once in a while I have to drive if there's like a train strike or something, but I will go on a train and I will see Spurs fans going up and down uh, both ways. Um, always enjoying themselves. There's, there's always supporters that crack open a can of beer so early in the morning and I just... Fair play. I, I, I could not over... And sometimes I'm talking like seven, six, seven in the morning. Fair play, because I could not manage... My body could not manage that. At the end of the day, I would be struggling. Um, food on the go, not so much. You, you kind of get there and you get whatever the press food may be there. Mixing well reporters, yeah, we're kind of a quite a, a close-knit band. We've been covering the club for, for a, a while um, and we all get on very well. There's no rivalry in that aspect. I think, of course, we all want to kind of break stories before the other one does, but, you know, they, they can be kind of, we can be quite collaborative. I think I said uh, last week um, in the press conferences, we'll often kind of, discuss what questions we're going to ask and stuff like that and uh, make sure that we um, you know cover all bases and get everything that the fans want asked as well um, and work what it entails a lot of stuff there's a lot of writing on a match day a lot of stuff because I'll be doing um, pre-match stuff I'll be running a live match blog during the game for those who can't watch it I'll be doing player ratings setting up the press conference live blog for afterwards um, I'll be doing running that blog when it obviously happens while asking questions, um, writing up the transcript afterwards, writing up my talking points from the game. Yeah, there's a fair bit. Again, don't weep for me. It's a great day. It's, I love match days. I absolutely love it. I'm getting paid to go and watch football and write about it and everything. So I'm not moaning at all. Um, that's kind of it, really. But uh, I could go. I'll go into more in depth at some point. Uh, Mark Trower, 2267, asked, do you think Dragoshin could make a good number six? Um, that's a difficult one because the number six role is very specific in a Postgre system, although we all say that sixes and eights are exactly the same. But there is a lot of twisting and turning and passing and motoring up the pitch. I'll probably say out of the defenders, probably Mickey van der Ven maybe would be the best at it, although Romero is very good at that as well. I think all three of them would bring certain aspects to it, but I prefer them all as centre-backs. Um, Dave and Pam Beveridge 3040 asks, uh, ask, do you see Ben Davies working as a youth coach for Spurs in the near future? I would imagine he'll start in that capacity. We've spoken about him getting his A licence and he's working towards his pro licence, or he wants to, So um, before he hangs up his boots. So I think, yes, I wouldn't be shocked if that happens. Um... Granty1954 asks, what is the embargo section that you hear at the beginning of the manager's interview? That's the section that um, is mainly written. It was never used to be recorded. For some reason, the last couple of years, it started to be recorded like on, on video. It was never meant to be. And I do feel that's kind of detracted slightly from it. It used to be this period where there were no cameras. The manager could sit back in his seat. I think I've said this before. Pochettino used to lean so far back, he almost fell off once. Um, but they're so much more laid back, and we used to get some really good stuff out of them because there was no cameras on them. They felt they didn't feel like they were still being watched. And also, if they said something that was really daft and they didn't mean it or they were going to retract something, then you know they could discuss that with us, or the press officer can discuss with us, and it can be taken out. Whereas now it's recorded, it kind of feels more just an extension of the press conference, which is a shame. But I guess there's a need for video content nowadays. Um, and yeah, so essentially it's, it's an old fashioned thing in a way that was for newspapers. They would want something for their morning papers the next morning or whatever morning it was going to go out on. And then they would almost like bury the online version of it at half ten at night the night before because they, the thinking was, oh, people aren't online at that time anyway. But actually the way the world works now, a lot of people read stuff at half ten. Um, so that's where it came from. Um, I would be stunned if it's still going within a certain number of years because it is a bit of an archaic thing especially with the advent of the web and and, and a lack of kind of focus on print and deadlines and stuff so yeah we'll see we'll see where that goes um what else we got ajr6648 do you expect oliver skip to leave in the summer i think he will probably need to but like i say whether that happens now because of those uh, club train numbers i don't know um, oh, Edward Talks 4261 also asked about the day of the life in a journalist. What's it like? What time do you wake up as a journalist and what time do you arrive at the games? I'm quite... 
I'm a bit of a night owl, as you, you might have heard when I've talked about movies and stuff like that. So I'll often go to bed very late and wake up a little bit later. But in terms of matches, I always get there um, three um, three hours before uh, a game so I can really start cracking into my work. Um, yeah, I'm just sorry, I'm just checking. I'm just going to send some more stuff about So I had, it's just typical as I'm trying to wrap this video up. I'm just double checking whether it changes anything. Um, okay, that's interesting. Um, yeah, it's just essentially saying that UEFA could be slightly different. Um, I think with UEFA, maybe the um, you know with UEFA, UEFA is maybe the entire season thing comes into play more than it does the Premier League one. Um, so yeah. We wait to see. It's weird to see that kind of maybe clears it up, but so it might be that it's Premier League homegrown, but not European. But we'll see. Again, I need to kind of completely clarify whether UEFA definition um, means that because he was signed on August twenty seventh, twenty eighth, whatever I said it was, whether that plays its part or not, we'll see. But yeah, um, yeah, that's it really. I think there's there's a. Lots of art people ask about kind of movie questions as well, which uh, I can probably kind of keep to. If you're not aware, I do the uh, Gold Goes to the Movies, the other movie, uh, the, my other YouTube channel. Um, so I can probably keep movie stuff to there. Like I see, someone's asking Kimchi B asks, are there spoilers in the movie reviews? No, they're spoiler free. That was kind of one of the things I wanted to do. They were kind of to give you an idea of what you might want to watch that night on telly or go to the cinema to see. Um, so yeah, yeah. Uh, right, I'm going to head off there because it was just only going to be a shorter one, so it's a little bit shorter. Um, apologies if the home ground stuff fried your brain like it did me, and I still don't think we're entirely no kind of right at the conclusion of whether Saar is or not a home ground player next season. But you've got an idea of how many other issues there are within those limits and what it means for the transfer window. So right, there you go. Right, I am going to head off now. Press conference tomorrow with Ange, um, and then the uh, twelve thirty match at Newcastle. We'll see how it goes. Hopefully, a good day. Hopefully, a bit like the Villa Park day, rather than the Craven Cottage uh, visit. We'll see. Right, time to head off. As always, stay healthy, stay safe, look after yourselves. I shall catch you later. Goodbye.